It was a Saturday morning and the pastor's wife was preparing pancakes for her two young boys and the boys were arguing about who should have the, the first pancake and their mother saw this as a teaching moment and took the opportunity to say to them, if Jesus was sitting there, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. And the older brother thought about this and nodded and said to his younger brother, you be Jesus. <laughs> Over these last four weeks, we've been looking at this series, Reset. We began by asking Jesus to reset, to retune our hearts, and then to reset our minds, that they would be filled with Scripture and God's Word and and last week, we looked at resetting our voice, that our words would be words of, of grace in troubled times. Today, we focus on reset hands, hands that God has given all of us that might serve, that might serve the will of God. Or to put it simply, that you might be Jesus, that I might be Jesus, that His thoughts, His words, his hands might be my hands. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Galatians 5, 13 and 14. The amazing thing about being reset by Jesus is that it actually begins to impact what we do. We all spend our time doing something. So what if we devote the action of our lives to God? Our hearts, our thoughts, our words, but today, what is it that we, that we do? What notable accomplishment do the Hollywood legends Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks have in common? Well, on April the 30th, 1927, they were the first two movie stars to have their handprints embedded in wet cement outside the legendary Grammans Chinese Theater in, in Hollywood. It's today known as TCL Chinese Theater, and many others have done the same over the decades. Find a moment, even today, and consider and count the vast number of actions our hands are capable of. We can steer a three and a half thousand pound vehicle with our hands at 65, 70 miles an hour. Not on the US 19, but... Uh, on <laughs> we can uh, do detailed, delicate needlepoint with our hands. We can operate a keyboard and type all kinds of things with our hands. We can, we can give directions, or at least we used to before we had GPS on our smartphones. Do you remember those times? I remember in England, we'd go out into the country on vacation, we'd be lost, and we'd find somebody, and they would give us directions with their hands, and it would always be, go back the way you came. <laughs> that way, they'd point. We can hold a child with our hands. We can prepare a meal. We can hit throw and catch a ball. We can play a musical instrument, what great musicians we have here. We can paint a wall, we can, with our finger, slide a touch screen and see all kinds of things. We can take a credit card with our hands and just do such powerful things with that, just by inserting it or swiping it. But the question is, like Mary Pickford all those years ago, that left her handprints in the wet cement do the prints, our hands leave behind, where our hands go, where our hands will go, do they bring honor to God? Do they bring God honor and build his kingdom? Benjamin Morrill 
an 18th century American traveler and sea captain, said, morale is when your hands and feet keep on working, even when your head says it can't be done. Even when your head, and, and you, you've known moments when your head says, this isn't working. This just can't be done. Let's, let's give up. But your hands keep on going. You keep on pushing through. You look at Mark 2, verses 1 through 12, our second scripture today, and it's one of those miracles where it just can't be done. But Jesus, who is surrounded by people in a home packed to the rafters, it was impossible. It couldn't be done to get a bed through that door. Impossible. The head says it can't be done, but the hands of the four friends keep going. They, they carry him onto the roof. They make an opening with their hands in the roof. They lower him gradually, carefully down on his mat before Jesus with their hands. And the determination, these hands of these four friends is what the miracle is all about. It's the only time that Jesus said, their faith has made you well. Not the faith of the man on the mat, but the faith of the four friends that brought him. Which goes to show that four of a kind beats a full house. <laughs> With the help of this scripture, I want to offer to you three ways that reset hands operate. Uh, and you can fill them in. It's just one word each time. And it's in the bulletin. But reset hands, retuned hands for Jesus are first of all responsive hands. They respond, they, they see that need. The four men are responsive. They are quick to react to the plight of their paralyzed friend. They're quick to respond to Jesus being, what did it say, back in their hometown. Jimmy comes home from school and his mum says, what did you do at school today? And he said, we had a guessing game. And she said, I thought you had a math test. He said, that's right. We did a, we did a guessing game. Reset, reset hands are firm and certain and clear. There's no guesswork. There's no uncertainty. They go in. They see the need. And they respond. In November 2010, that's very much what happened at a wedding party in Glenelg, Australia, at a beach uh, uh, the ceremony had finished and they were posing for pictures, the wedding party, on a scenic ledge overlooking the ocean when a 55-year-old woman, unrelated to the wedding, fell into the water, couldn't swim, started drowning. And dressed in his tuxedo, the best man dived into the water and was able to bring her into the shallows. And then the bride, a trained nurse, waded into the water, still in her wedding dress and started administering CPR to the woman. By the time the emergency services arrived, the woman had regained consciousness. Safety official Shane Dorr said the woman was very lucky that the bridal party responded because moments later she may have not made it. After their daring rescue operation, the, the best man and the bride still soaked through from their rescue, rejoined the rest of the group for the remainder of the wedding reception. And that is very much a picture of the church. We dress for the King of Kings. We dress for the one we come to worship. But with our hands and feet, we also respond to needs where we see them. We also dive in to mission. We also dive in even when it's inconvenient, even when it's, even when it's dangerous. And we see that around our church. We see that around our community. And we see that Worship needs mission, but mission also needs worship. Praise and serving are complementary dual qualities that define the two qualities of the church. Without uh, uh, worship, mission will dry up. But without a mission, worship will become insular. We need both. And to truly worship God, the Bible says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is true and proper worship. Which brings us to the second way our hands are reset. They are sacrificial hands. Sacrificial hands. There was a, a boat that capsized in the ocean and, and the rescue helicopter dropped a long thick rope and there was four men and one woman in the boat and they grabbed hold of the rope 
and it began to lift them up, and then the pilot realized five people were too heavy for that rope, and they were going to pull the helicopter down. He shouted down and said, one of you is going to have to let go and plunge into the icy, dangerous water below. Four men and one woman. And there was silence, and then suddenly the woman spoke up, and she said, I will be the one to let go. Because after all, throughout history, women have been making sacrifices. Women have put children first. Women have put their husbands first. Women have put their nation first in times of need and war. Women have given up what they have so that they could show their love and sacrifice to others so that they would go out without food and warmth and shelter so that others might have that. And at the end of this incredible speech, the four men all started clapping. Never underestimate the power of an intelligent woman. <laughs> the sacrifice that she talked about is what reset hands truly are about. They are sacrificial. Sacrificial is not counting the cost. The four men didn't count the cost. They didn't weigh up uh, the pros and cons. It doesn't tell us any of that in Scripture. It tells us that they sacrificed their dignity what kind of reputation they had was quickly dismantled as they did what they did. They, they uh, probably sacrificed some money as they later had to pay for the repairs on that roof. They sacrificed their time. They sacrificed their energy. These four men refused to put a price, refused to limit how far they would go for the sake of their paralyzed friend. This is a 72-year-old Fran Drodes, in 2016, 26,639 people completed the Boston Marathon. Fran came 26,639th. Fran came last. The roaring crowds and uh, official coronation had long departed. Workers were tearing down the, the stands and the barricades when she finally crossed the line at 8.45 p.m., but the real story is who Fran was running for. Droads had run marathons before, but she ran the 216 Boston Marathon for the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And her husband, Stan, who had battled cancer himself three times in 2019, is still with her, met her at the finish line that night with her medal. In fact, Stan, her husband, had called the police earlier in the day, concerned his wife may have got lost or hurt. But no, one news reporter really summed it up when he said, it turns out that the race's loser, Fran coming last, was the true winner. Because she sacrificed. She didn't count the cost, she didn't care about the reputation, it wasn't about where she finished, it was about who she raced for. She persevered. And the Apostle Paul says in Romans 12, 1, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of what Christ sacrificed for you, offer your bodies as a, as a living sacrifice, which means all in, not just our, our time or our uh, uh, resources, but our whole lives, holy and pleasing to God. Sacrifice is giving something up that you notice when you give it up, whether it's time or, or money or reputation. So this week, God is saying to you, how can you sacrifice? How can you have hands that are sacrificial? How can you meet a need? Look in our bulletin at the many ways you can serve through food pantry and thrift shop and through different mission activities throughout the year. Third and lastly, reset hands are courageous. They're, they're courageous. They're, they're, they're brave. Uh, scattered around our home are pictures of, of Heather and me on various theme park roller coaster rides. These are the official ones that you purchase after the ride is over. And in a moment of giddy excitement that you did it, you go through the gift shop, because the exit is always the gift shop, and they have your picture from the ride for $19.95. And you hand over your money, you buy it, because I kid myself that I was courageous as I clung on to the safety bar. And I look at the picture afterwards, and my eyes are closed, and the woman with big hair in front of me is covering up my face anyway. So nobody knows if I was actually on the ride. 
But as I got hurled up and down several stories on Tower of Terror, I felt my hands were brave hands as they held on tightly to that ride. But that's not true courage. True courage is that displayed by the four men as they transported their friend. True courage is of those eight hands that faced opposition down. With courage, there is always opposition. And the opposition was at every turn for these four men. There was the opposition of the religious scribes that we read, who, who poured scorn on Jesus and the four men that brought their friend. There is the opposition of the crowds that blocked their way, that wouldn't get out of the way so they could get to Jesus. Sometimes that's a picture today of, of the church that stops others getting to Jesus even. And the four friends face opposition of the physical building. And they climb upon the roof, and in the first century, Galilee had flat roofs. And they were made of mud, and they were daubed the mud on layers of beams and branches, and they made this thick layer of covering that was the roof. And that's why the scripture tells us that they had to uh, go on the roof and dig through it. It would take time. It wasn't instant. Uh, the, the picture you often have is they cut a quick hole and lowered their friend. It took time. Probably took some criticism as people said, what are you doing up there? And, and that's what cur courage is. It's refusal to give up. It's got perseverance written all the way through it. And Jesus is saying to you, what opposition are you facing right now? I'm there with you. Maybe it's opposition from people around you that you work with, that you volunteer with, that people within your own family is the opposition. Maybe it's opposition in the form of things like health. Our finances are opposing us. Well, the Scripture says in Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord. That, that, that breakthrough, that, that opposition that we're digging our way through, wait on the Lord, Psalm 27, 14. Be of good courage because He shall strengthen your hands. He shall strengthen your heart. Being courageous is not a feeling. If, if you wait until you feel courageous before you do something, you may never actually do something. We have to decide to be courageous. The great military leader, General Wellington, was famous for being very nervous before battle. He found his knees would shake so violently that he had attendants either side of him that would hold him while he mounted his horse ready for battle. And he would announce to his knees, knees you may shake how you will, but you would shake even more if you knew where I was going to take you. And, and so it is with us that our knees may be knocking, our nervousness may be consuming us, but courage is that decision to persevere anyway. It's not a decision born out of haste. It's not a decision poorly thought out. Martin Luther said, when it comes to serving God with our hands, I've held many things in my hands and I've lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I, that I still possess. That is, that is a good investment. That is eternal investment. What you place into God's hands, that will not be taken from you. That is what God will persevere. That is rock-solid ground, whether it's for people or things for his kingdom. I've heard it said that there are two great moments in a person's life. Uh, the moment they were born and the moment you realize why you were born. Galatians 4, 13, 14 reminds you why you were born. You were born for freedom not to be enslaved, not to be crushed, not to be limited, but to live freely in Christ, and to enjoy Christ, and to live freely, to live freely from sin, to live freely from the expectations of others, to live freely, but wait, our freedom is not for ourselves alone. It's also for those who are still bound up, who are not free, that we might courageously help set free. One of golf's more interesting stories came in the 1870s when a Scotsman in Scotland was demonstrating the new game of golf to the President Ulysses Grant. A gallery of newspaper reporters had arrived to watch the scene and the Scotsman carefully placed the golf ball on the tee, positioned himself and took a mighty swing and the club hit the turf and scattered 
dirt all over the president's beard and the gathered onlookers. When the dust settled, the ball still remained on the tee. Again, the Scotsman swung with even more enthusiasm, but again he missed. And after several more attempts and misses, the Scotsman stopped. And the president, wiping dirt from his beard and from his face, said, there seems to be a fair amount of exercise in this new game. But I fail to see the purpose of the ball. Imagine the game of golf without ever understanding or enjoying the purpose of the golf ball. I know some of you are nodding and are still trying to understand the purpose of the ball. Imagine the church without ever fully understanding, fully enjoying the purpose of its believers. It's not to simply sit and wait for the kingdom to come and for us all to be gathered up into glory. The purpose of the church right now in this moment is to be Jesus, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to serve God, to continue to build his kingdom. Jesus says, let me reset your heart and faith will be alive. Let me reset your mind and scripture will speak to you. Let me reset your voice and your words will be my words. Let me reset your hands and your actions will bring me glory. We're going to close in a moment with a prayer. And this prayer is in our United Methodist hymnal. It's 570, if you want to look it up at another time. 570 in our hymnal. But before we pray it, I want you to look at the Word. Perhaps read it through once quietly to yourself. To let the words sink in. To absorb what these words are. And when we've had a moment, we'll then pray it out loud together. But let's quietly look and read it first before we read it out loud. I invite you with me to read this prayer, to say this prayer, to pray this prayer out loud. Let's do it carefully and thoughtfully as we think about these incredible words. Let's pray. Teach us, good Lord, to serve you as you deserve to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not seek the rest, to labor and not to ask for any reward, except that of knowing that we do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.